In this episode, I'm going to do a review of the Insta360 ONE RS 1 inch 360 edition camera for doing virtual tours for real estate photography. I'm going to compare it to its closest rivals, which are the Theta Z1 and also the Tricio Lite. I'm going to use this review to show how it works for doing real world virtual tours and not a lot of the other hyped up stuff that's been out there on the internet because of this new camera that's come out. It is an action camera also, but does it really stand up to the test of using this for professional virtual tour photography? So there's some things that I really loved about this camera. There's some things that I really didn't, and there's some things that you really need to be aware of if you're going to use it. Would I recommend it? I'll get to that later. I do want to start first though with some of the image quality, but before that, just a quick disclaimer that I did receive a camera for free from Insta360. They reached out to me for a review, but as you know from other reviews that I do on on my YouTube channel. I do not give good reviews just because I've gotten paid for a review or if someone's given me a piece of gear. Instead, it's from top to bottom, warts and all. That's what this episode is going to show also. Insta360 is very aware of that. And so here we go. To compare quality, I did straight off the shelf, straight out of camera comparisons using in-camera HDR on all three cameras. Now, while the Theta Z1 has the dual fisheye plug-in, the One RS doesn't require any add-ons and neither does Tricio. I also added a comparison to Insta360's HDR and hand blending their DNG files. It actually does a better job than their HDR. And I've also done some outside tests here, but first let's take a look at the standard HDR out of camera results. We can see here, this is the RS1 and it's a little on the warm side. Uh, that doesn't bother me. I can change that in post processing. But when I took it to the uh, outside view, it barely captured that in the HDR. It did over here because there's a lot less light here. There's a lot more light streaming in here. Also not that great a job on the uh, color of the flooring as light was streaming in very heavily through there. So overall it's okay except when we take a look at these windows up here now there's a little bit of blue sky but let's compare that to the other cameras when we take a look at tricio the colors look a lot better but there is so much purple fringing going on here so much chromatic aberration coming from their lens so i think the leica lens does help in that regard so it definitely will reduce that the Tricio got a little bit better view to the outside through this window, but when we take a close look, we can see that it goes flat. It does lack saturation. But that's one thing that isn't such a problem when it comes to doing interiors. In fact, also, by the way, my cat decided to get in on the action when I was taking some of these pictures. Let's take a look at the Theta Z1, though, when we go to the inside. And that's never been really good in HDR unless you use their dual fisheye plug-in. And that's just another add-on. I mean, they should just have that in camera. This should just come with it. But the purple fringing also shows up. No matter what, this is more of a lens thing. So the Theta Z1 doesn't have a lens that compares to what the RS1 does using those Leica lenses. So you're gonna get better results out of the RS1. Remember when we go back here, we really don't see that purple fringing, none of that chromatic aberration. Their HDR uh, pure shot does leave some harsh shadows around here, but the hand blending you'll see will get rid of that. And of course we get that terrible outside view here where the Theta Z1 really didn't do such a bad job. I mean, it probably had the best outside view of all three cameras that were tested. But would I trust the Theta Z1 for doing HDR in camera? No way. I use it uh, and I capture multiple exposures um, in DNG and then I manually blend those using luminosity masking. It's that workflow that I have, by the way, in my book on virtual tour photography. Link to that also in the description for this video. But let's take a look now at the RS1 doing the HDR inside using their pure shot compared to if I hand blend it using that luminosity masking technique that I have in my virtual tour photography book. And you can see there is a big difference. Yeah, it's brighter. I'm in more control of that, but there's no purple fringing because of those Leica lenses. And then when we go over here, the view's okay. I could have probably increased that. In fact, if I'd have just toned down some of this exposure, it would have been better. But over here, we can see that that exposure is well too. The one thing that we can see definitely is when we go in here, we can see that it's a lot sharper. So the HDR is just making it too soft in many areas. So 
So using the uh, manual blending method with their DNG files, then I get a much better product than what comes out of their HDR Pure Shot. It just is jaggedy looking. It does have some artifacts in it, like they over sharpened it. Uh, the colors tend to be way oversaturated, so we're getting banding and all kinds of other artifacts up here. Compared to though, when I did it myself hand blended, none of that stuff exists. Now, the advantage though of using this, and I'll mention this more than once, is that I can shoot an HDR image using the RS1, and if I like it, that's great, but if not, it'll also have the DNG files, so I can make a decision later. I don't have to have it as a forethought, it can also be an afterthought. Now let's take a look at going outside. So when we go outside with the RS1, this is where it really showed its strength. Now there were some problems, I'll show you here in a second, but this is where you'll see all the time people that are giving these reviews or the ads, they're doing something outside. Yeah, that's the easy stuff. Inside photography is tough, right? So uh, this is no surprise that I would expect results like this. This is though their Pure Shot HDR. You will notice though over here, we've got some problems, some type of stitching error going on here. It's gotta be a stitching error. I can't imagine that it's anything else, but I do have some stitching tests that I'll get to here in a second to uh, test that out, see how well it performs. Anyways, let's take a look at the Tricio outside and it just is horrific. Uh, one thing right off the bat you might notice is it's tilted. That's because it doesn't do any horizontal alignment, at least not to the extent that the RS1 does. So this automatically will set the horizon to horizontal, and no matter what I did with the Tricio, you try to bring it around to this fence and you just, you can't level that out no matter how you move it. But you can see it's very dull looking. I could maybe saturate that, but look it up here. That stitching of the sun flare, I'm not out to capture sun flares, but it's just an example of some of the stitching problems. If you take a look at the RS1, boom, look at that. It's more rounded. Once again, it's not gonna be the greatest flare um, that we have there. Let's take a look at the Theta Z1 outside, and it's just like everything else with the Theta Z1 HDR without using the Pure Shot. It's kind of just a hot mess. It really doesn't have um, anything super spectacular about it. A little bit on the flat side, yeah, I could use it, but quite honestly, when I'm doing these type of uh, shoots outside with a Theta Z1, I just do it in manual mode. And also most of the time when I'm doing the outside photos for a 360 tour, I just use a DSLR on a pano head. It's just a single shot four times around. It's easy then to stitch those in PT GUI. But anyways, I did think that out of those three cameras, the RS1 was the best. Once again, we can see the RS1 results here. We can see the Tricio going very flat and tilted without horizontal alignment here. And then the Theta Z1, not bad. It falls in between, but still kind of soft. And it would do much better by just using the DNG files and editing those. I'll get to the stitching tests in just a second, but I wanted to show you also uh, the app that's used for doing the stitching for the Insta360 photos. Now, this is kind of a dedicated process because Insta360 has those INSP files that are alongside other files. In fact, if you were just to shoot JPEG, you're gonna get INSP files that have to be brought in here. And then uh, if you shoot in the uh, HDR photo, you, which I'll show here in a second, using their uh, Pure Shot, then you're also gonna get DNG files. So you can see that's what I did here. These were, this was a particular uh, Pure Shot uh, HDR image, and that's the one that we just saw. And when we look at then the DNG file of it, it's a little bit different. So Pure Shot wasn't applied to it. So that's what would, uh, all that the Pure Shot does is really just extend the dynamic range and kind of brighten it up. You can see that's why the view outside went away. When we take a look at here, there's more of that view. But if you did like the HDR, don't think that you can just now export the DNGs from this file. It's something that's just a little confusing. If you are selecting the uh, HDR image itself, when you right click on it and then start exporting, it can export all exposure photos, but those will be JPEGs. What you wanna do is have then the DNG of the HDR selected, and when you right click on that, then you can select what type of export you want, DNG, JPEG, or both. And so you would be selecting the DNG to export this out. 
But one of the frustrating things with using an app like this is you have to figure it out for yourself. There's really no help. There's no documentation. It's very frustrating um, getting stuff to do professional work and not having a document to, to refer to. Even if it's online, give me a document. I don't want to be watching your YouTube videos. Give me something with links to it. We're used to buying very expensive cameras that have tons of documentation on them. So Insta360, please provide better documentation. The other thing here too is this really just does the stuff stitching. And that's, that's good enough. It really doesn't do any editing. But if you're really going to rely on HDR out of camera images uh, like this one, it didn't do a bad job, but I did want to correct the colors. Well, I, I got to correct the colors with a JPEG file later. I would much rather do that with a DNG, but I can't export this as a DNG. I'm left to now hand blending this all myself. Okay, I want to take a look at the stitching test. As we saw when we were looking outside, if you recall, when we were looking at the fence, we saw some weird kind of aberrations going on on the RS1, something blurry going on right there. Well, that's typically a stitching error. So if we take a look at the close up of this, and you know, this is a shot that I like to get when I'm doing virtual tours put the camera in a threshold of a doorway so that I can only have to take one shot to see the bathroom and then the shower over on this side. This happens to also have a water closet in it. But anyways, I, this threshold test uh, doing this it works fairly well because I, I think that stitching area might have just been a one-off. Who knows what it was? The camera got confused somehow, but I didn't see it here. So when I go up and around here to the whole door frame, this is where I should see the stitching area. Uh, era. I don't see it. I mean, the one thing you will see is that there are two different white balances going on here because one lens is facing forward, one lens is facing back. So this would also require editing. And quite honestly, this, I would never trust this HDR out of camera. This would be one that I just manually blend myself. It just doesn't make any sense to have something this awful looking for a house that's worth what it is. You can see the beautiful paint colors on the walls here. And by the way, that's one of Jonathan's uh, shots here with a drone up in Ventura. But anyways, let's take a look at the next threshold test here. This was also very close. It's just going into another doorway here to see how well it would work. And it did a fairly good job. I really didn't see much in the way of stitching. A couple of weird things going on up here, but nothing really noticeable, nothing that would affect it. But once again, the colors are way off. I know my walls are not reddish purple out in the hallway, and I know they're not orange inside here from these lights. It just couldn't figure that out across both lenses. So once again, this is where I'd want to hand blend this myself. So speaking of these small spaces, also how does it do in small rooms? So I took it into the master bath. And so here, this would be very typical. I'd want to step inside. Now, obviously, I would you know, use cube faces or something else to edit out the tripod. I just left it in here for this just so we can test it. And in here, this was just using their HDR Pure Shot. And it did a very good job, but it also cued me in on something else that was going on here with the camera. And that's that even though they advertise this camera as a low light camera, it didn't do very well in low light. Let's go back over here, for instance, here where we were in low light, the colors are horrific. It also gets extremely soft and extremely grainy. When we go into this, which is a very well lit bathroom in the house here, we can see that it's much sharper. Now, I might have also, because of just the feature that this would show inside the house, I'd want to manually blend this probably with the DNGs. But this was just using the uh, HDR with Pure Shot, and I thought that it did a very good job with it for what it's worth. And it's always going to be quicker, obviously, if you can just take that one shot and be done with it. So just HDR Pure Shot, no other editing. This is just straight out of camera, straight off the shelf. And it did, I think, a very good job with this for a very small room. We look up, we don't see any stitching errors at all. So that was very uh, welcoming. I was very concerned when I first did the outside tests and I saw that problem with the fence. So these last few tests with the threshold and also the small room, I felt this was very acceptable out of their camera. Taking a look at a few specs and seeing how this compares the image size when we're looking at the RS1, it's 21 megapixels. The Theta Z1, that's 23 megapixels. It's pretty similar. The Tricio comes out at 32 megapixels, but that's also because it takes that four images in rotation. But the megapixel count really doesn't matter so much as it does the sensor size because that's what's going to collect how much information can be brought in from the amount of light, the sensor size, the photo site size, 
size on each of the sensors and then the image quality. So when we look at the RS1, it's a one inch sensor, just the same as the Theta Z1, where the Tricio has, it's not quite even a, a one half uh, inch sensor, but of course it takes those four images in rotation. Well, the difference though between the RS1 and the Theta Z1 is that the RS1 does have that co-engineering from Leica, so it's got those Leica lenses. That's why you're gonna see uh, less of the aberrations, the purple fringing and whatnot, but when it comes to the image quality itself, the sensor really is gathering pretty much the same amount of information. It's also though in how they are processing that on the back end. If you were to take a look at one-to-one -one on the DNG files, the only difference you're gonna see between the Theta Z1 and the RS1 are things like the aberrations and some color stuff too that really has more to do with the lenses and the finishes on the lenses. Now the price, that's uh, kind of a nice thing on the RS1 because it's only $800 in comparison to the Z1, which is over $1,000 these days. The Tricio comes in at only $400. It's very well priced. It's only half the price of an RS1. And if you're, all you're doing is virtual tours, the Tricio can get by with doing quite a bit of that. But the RS1 really does up the game and for less cost than the Theta Z1. So it does come in at a very attractive cost. So one of the things that I mentioned was I like the ability to shoot HDR and the ability to have those DNG files. So this was something that if we take a look at the app itself to control it, if I were just shooting in the pure shot mode, that's all I have. I have pure shot or JPEG. If I do pure shot for HDR photo, then I'm gonna get those DNG files as well as the HDR photo itself. If I were just to select the photo, then I would be limited to the choices that I have. So here I can only select, once I'm in photo mode, I can JPEG, JPEG plus raw or pure shot. So it's a little confusing that if I'm in HDR photo, all I have to do is select pure shot and I've got JPEG plus DNG, but if I'm shooting just regular photo mode, then I don't have that ability. So it's kind of a little bit strange, but just be aware of my recommendation using HDR photo with then the uh, pure shot. That'll get you the DNG files. Anyways, another little thing that I liked on here was that it does have a histogram. So if you want to and see how well it's exposing, you can turn on the histogram. It's a small little thing up at the top, but if you were gonna be relying on doing just photos and doing each exposure individually or just single shot photos, you can see how well it's exposing by using the histogram. I found though the auto mode to work fairly well. The one thing that I liked about the uh, RS1 that's different from the other cameras is it has this modular design. It's in actually a case. It doesn't look like it at first. It's got your standard tripod mount on the bottom of it, but these dual lenses are actually part of a bigger component. So what you can do is disassemble this whole thing and then you've got battery, camera, and then the lenses themselves. So let's take a look at that. You squeeze together these little things on the side here and then you can pull the lens completely off. So that can be changed out. Something breaks, something happens. That's a modular piece that can be replaced. Then we'll set that aside. You can then disassemble the rest of this by first just flipping up the door here, which would be for the USB cable. And that allows then this case to then unlock these and you just slide those out of there. So now you've got this whole component that's separate from the case itself. And then you can pull these two pieces apart which now you've got a separation of your battery, which you can buy separate. So you can buy another one of these batteries for about $50, um, so you can have more charge online, or if one gets old and goes bad. In here then, that's where you would put then the micro SD card that goes in that slot right there. So it is a little bit cumbersome if you do need to take it apart to get the micro SD card. It's not that bad. It actually is a very well protected area for it. And it's very simple to assemble and put back together as well. But I really like the idea that you can have this modularity. Like with the Theta Z1, the battery's built in. And same with the Tricio. Yeah, you can charge it, but then as they age and they don't hold as much charge, well, 
you're kind of screwed on that. But this though, you get a replacement. I really like that, having this replacement battery. And of course, then to put it together, you just put this, it's just the reverse process, putting this back in there, making sure that it's in there nice. And then yeah, you just put this on by squeezing those in there and boom, our camera is back assembled again. So once again, pulling it apart, does it take that much time to get to it? Not really, just pull the lens off flip the USB cover up, and then just slide out the whole section, and then just pull it apart, and there's your SD card. The biggest issue though that I had with this One RS is that it had some USB issues. Now, I could get it to work every single time, but there's two things you need to be aware of. First, when you set up this camera, it'll show that it's doing a formatting of your micro SD card. It is lying, it is not. I proved that, I went back to Insta360 and showed them that you still have to format this card. Don't make an assumption once you put your micro SD card in there for the first time, that it's gonna be okay, even though it shows in the menu that now the status is formatting your micro SD card. Don't format it yourself no matter what. That's fine, you can get past that. But the bigger problem was that the USB errors that I was getting are something that's also common out there. So every time I plug in the uh, RS1 to one of my PCs, I get this big error that something malfunctioned. And that just doesn't make any sense. I'm still able to get the files off of it. So I reached out to Insta360 about this problem, explained that this was happening on multiple PCs that I'm running, and their answer was just that, well, it does kind of happen on various PCs. Now, as you may know, I used to be an engineer in a prior life, and I was an engineering manager, and I can tell you this, that if one of my engineers gave me that response, they would be looking for work elsewhere. It is unacceptable, Insta360, to have any type of errors like that. You need to have somebody who's working on your USB drivers address this so you don't get these warnings. It is just very disheartening if you're doing professional work and you see things like this come up. No camera that I've ever used, no of the uh, none of the other devices of external drives or whatnot that I use for my photography business have these errors, no errors at all from USB. So that needs to be addressed. But there is an easy enough workaround for that with that said, and that's that since it is modular, you can just pop that SD card out, put it into your uh, device, your computer, laptop, PC, whatever, and you can transfer files without any error. So there's no problem doing that at all. My other big complaint that I have is just the lack of documentation. Anytime a manufacturer makes a product that they want to put into the hands of professional photographers, they need to have documentation. It's the same way for any profession. You don't want people to just fish through it and make some guesses. This isn't a hobby. They might be used to making some action cameras or whatnot for the hobbyist market. But if you're trying to make it for virtual tours, you're working into now the professional business of doing photography and we need to have reference material. I had to fish through stuff, try stuff. It took me a long time to experiment finding these things that I have in this review and then going back to my contact at Insta360 with these questions to have them then respond. So Insta360, make some documentation and make it very concise and make sure that it is available before you release your cameras. So the big question is, would I recommend this camera? The answer is yes. I find that this camera probably can do better than the Ricoh Theta Z1. And I'm not talking about having the HDR plug-in for the Theta Z1, it has nothing to do with that. I can get by some of these other issues, uh, maybe a lack of documentation, and also I've gotta pop the SD card out, and hopefully though they'll fix the USB connection. Those are things I can live with. But the one thing that I really, really liked about this camera was that along with the quality that does go along par and sometimes exceeds past the Theta Z1 and definitely the Tricio, is that you can shoot HDR and then while you're doing it using the pure shot mode, you also get DNG files. When you get back later, you can decide, is that HDR good enough for me to pop into the virtual tour? or do I need to improve it? Well, I've got the, H, the uh, DNG files that you can hand blend lum using luminosity masking, then using Photoshop and whatever, and then create that pano from those DNG files. So I felt that having instantly the best of both worlds was a fantastic thing. It's so automatic that I didn't have to, like I would with the Ricoh Theta Z1, start flipping through each exposure, take an exposure, flip through, take another exposure, do all that. I just did it once in pure shot mode. I have my DNG files plus that HDR image and I can make a decision on which one I wanna use. 
Quality is of course a major concern, but as I showed in this video, it definitely is a very good quality if you take the right approach. There's probably many instances where you could get by with their HDR shot, with the, with the pure shot, and just take the straight JPEG out of the stitching software. But in cases where you do need to do blending using the DNG files, they were good. They were on par, probably even better than what comes out of the Ricoh Theta Z1. I got fantastic results doing it. Once again, it was very quick. So quality, yes, I would put it very much up there. As far as the uh, use of it, I can get by some of the stuff with the uh, micro SD card issues and the USB issues, especially too, I've got a battery I can replace. For another $50, I could pop in another battery because it is modular, something that I really can't do with the other portable cameras. So overall, yes, I do think this is worth a try, especially since it is less expensive than the Ricoh Theta Z1. It is a lot more than the Tricio, but I think that you would be happy with the results in comparison.